Hey guys, welcome back. In this video, we're going to start topic three on organic and biological chemistry. Our first subtopic for topic three is an introduction to organic chemistry. So this will form a, a bit of a foundation. Our first science understanding is organic compounds can be represented by molecular and structural formulae. And you'll know, need to know how to determine the molecular formula of an organic compound given its extended, condensed or skeletal structural formula. Back in stage one chemistry, I would have introduced to you this idea of structural formulae. And if we start off with the full or extended structure, this shows you all of the atoms that are involved in covalent bonding within a molecule. We've got an example here of butane. We know that we could essentially group up the hydrogens that are bonded to each carbon and we can represent it in a more condensed form. We could even look at removing the bonds between the carbons. So we've got another condensed form. And also we can see that there are multiple CH2 groups within the chain. So we could put those in brackets and that's a further condensed structural formula. What we're going to be more concerned with is the one at the bottom here, which is the skeletal structural formula. And you can see it's, a, it's shown in a very simple manner. So it's often what we call a line structure as well, where each of the points or vertices represents a carbon atom, unless it actually shows you what atom it is. For hydrocarbons like butane, you only show the bonds between the carbon atoms, but the atoms themselves are actually taken out. The skeletal structural formula is designed to try and give you a better insight to the orientation of these atoms in three dimensions. So based on this skeletal structural formula, we'll see that each of these points here is a carbon atom, and we can see how many bonds it has with other carbons or even other atoms that aren't hydrogen. And from there, we can work out how many hydrogens or other atoms are bonded to it, given that carbon must form four covalent bonds to be stable. On this slide, we're going to look at how we can determine the molecular formulae of a range of skeletal diagrams. So we have three examples here. We're going to start off from the left, which is 2-propanol. It's also known as isopropyl alcohol. Typically, we start off with the carbons, followed by the hydrogens, and then any other atoms. So looking at 2-propanol, we can see that there are one, two, three carbon atoms. And a technique that I would like for you to employ is to put in the remaining bonds, which would be carbon to hydrogen bonds, and this will allow you to more easily count how many hydrogens there are. So starting off with the first carbon, we see that there is one carbon to carbon bond. So that means that it needs three more bonds and we can draw them in as such. Over to the second carbon, we can see three bonds. So it needs one more bond, which will be to a hydrogen. And the third carbon would have another three bonds or to hydrogens. So three carbons, in terms of hydrogens, we have three, four, five, eight and then it's got one oxygen, so its molecular formula is C3H8O. Over to our next example, which is ethylpropanoate. This is a substance which we call an ester. We can see that a couple of the carbons have been shown on the ends, but we can still count the carbons in the usual way. So we've got one, two, three, four, five carbons. Let's look at determining the hydrogens. Let's fill in those carbon to hydrogen bonds. So that's about it. And we should see that we've got three, five, seven, ten hydrogens. And then the last atom are the oxygens, and there are two of them. So ethylpropanoate's molecular formula is C5H10O2. The final molecule over to the right is paracetamol. Let's start off by counting the carbons. So we've got six within this benzene ring here, which is called a phenyl group. Then we've got another two here. So we've got eight carbons. Let's work out the hydrogens. So let's fill in any remaining bonds, just keeping in mind that carbon must form four covalent bonds. And so these will be bonds between carbon and hydrogen. So we've got one plus four, which is five, six, and another three is nine. From there, let's count the nitrogens. We can only see one here. And then finally, oxygens, we can see two there and there. And so its molecular formula should be C8H9 
and O2. In terms of the next science understanding, organic compounds are named systematically to provide unambiguous identification. This is something that we covered earlier in Stage 1 Chemistry, subtopic 3.3 on hydrocarbons, and I would like for you to refer back to that video so that you can uh, recall how you actually carry out systematic nomenclature, and you also look at how you can draw based on the systematic name of a hydrocarbon. Now from here it's important to note that we group up organic compounds based on certain groups called functional groups. Functional groups can consist of bonds, they can consist of atoms or groups of atoms that often determine the chemical properties of a molecule and the chemical properties determines how those compounds react with uh, other molecules. The key thing to note are the atoms or groups of atoms or bonds that help determine these types of organic compounds. For example, alcohols are represented by this OH group or what we call a hydroxyl functional group. Carboxylic acids can be identified based on this group here called a carboxyl group, which consists of a COOH and so on with your other types of organic compounds. What you'll need to be able to do is identify what type of organic compound is present based on the functional group or functional groups that are present. In this slide, I've summarized the key different functional groups that you'll need to be aware of. We've also got the suffix that indicates what functional group is present. So the first one here, if we have um, a name ending in ene, this indicates that we have an alkene as our organic compound. Uh, if we have a name ending in al, then this indicates it's an aldehyde, and so on. If we have a look over to the right column, this is a condensed structural formula which shows you the functional group that is present. So alkenes with a carbon-to-carbon -carbon double bond, alkynes with a carbon-to-carbon -carbon triple bond, and again, so on with the other different functional groups, and I've just highlighted those in bold there. You will need to be familiar with these and be able to identify these different functional groups within the structural formula of a compound. Our next science understanding, condensation reactions occur when two organic molecules combine to form a larger molecule, also releasing another small molecule such as water. Condensation reactions will be quite important looking at the formation of certain organic compounds like esters and amides. But it's also a key step looking at the formation of certain types of polymers as well. Condensation reactions involve reactions between certain functional groups. Typically they release a small molecule like water, but water isn't the only small molecule that can be released. One example where we see condensation reactions are in carbohydrates. We can look at taking the base unit of a carbohydrate, which is called a simple sugar or a monosaccharide, and if we look at bonding them together, they end up releasing water and they end up joining to one another. Another important condensation reaction is looking at the formation of esters and polymers of esters called polyesters. Over to the left here, we have what we call a carboxylic acid with its what we call carboxyl functional group. And this can react with an alcohol with its hydroxyl functional group. When these react together, they end up releasing uh, water as a small molecule. So this would indicate water there. And as a result, we get this carbon bonded to this oxygen in the alcohol. And it's the combination of these atoms here that form your ester functional group. But keeping in mind that it releases water as well. Another similar reaction that looks at the formation of esters involves what we call an acid chloride reacting with an alcohol. And this is just really showing you that you can form other molecules other than water as the small molecule that gets released. So in this case, we end up with HCl as our small molecule that gets released. And this is still going to result in the formation of an ester. As a final example, we can look at the formation of amides or polymers of amides called polyamides. And these condensation reactions are the basis of the formation of proteins from amino acids. So in this example here, we can see 
we've got a carboxyl group reacting with a, an amino group, functional group. This being a condensation reaction results in the formation of water. So we can see here that we have two hydrogens and an oxygen, which can bond together to form water. This gets released, and in doing so, we end up joining this carbon to this nitrogen here, and the result is what we call an amide group, or in the case for proteins, it's what we call a peptide link or a peptide group or peptide bond. This concludes the first part of subtopic 3.1 introduction. I'll see you guys in the next video.